Thanks very much. Uh, I want to start off by apologizing for my voice. Um, it's been going downhill, and I've been saying if I can just keep it till 2.40 this afternoon when I'm finished, and hopefully that holds out. So I want to start with the obligatory disclaimer. I'm doing this presentation uh, on my own personal effort, and uh, what I disclose does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of my employer. Uh, disclaimer number two is I'm talking about messing with hardware devices. Some of these hardware devices plug into the wall. Uh, if you don't know about electricity, please be careful when um, working on such devices. I'm not responsible if you electrocute yourself after this talk. <clears throat> so a uh, little bit about me. I'm a security engineer. I do black box testing and red teaming. Um, I'm a hacker in that I like to break things just to see if I can. Uh, and I'm particularly into embedded devices and the Internet of Things. Uh, Unfortunately, if you are allergic to buzzwords, you're going to hear IoT a lot during this talk. Um, and I also do some web apps, but I think that comes with the territory these days. Uh, I'm also a little bit of a maker. I like to make things out of electronics in addition to breaking things. Uh, last year, I actually made my own uh, unofficial DEF CON badge, uh, which was a lot of fun, although I only ended up making seven of them. But it might have been the most exclusive um, electronic DEF CON badge. I'm not sure. Uh, so what is IoT, right? If you go to Wikipedia, you get this really long definition about the Internet of Things as the network of devices, vehicles, home appliances, and other items embedded with electronics, software, sensors, blah, 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 and connects to the Internet. But quite frankly, it's, I like to take from Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, I know it when I see it. So these are devices that I would consider IoT devices, right? Many of you may be wearing a uh, fitness watch uh, of some sort right now. Uh, many of you may have some sort of little clicker. You, maybe you have uh, a device for tracking your keys when they get lost. Um, I have one on my keys, but, you know, knock on wood, I've never needed to use it to actually find my keys. But there's also bigger devices, right? We have smart light bulbs, we have smart home networks, um, and all these sort of things. And so at first glance, many of these things seem kind of innocuous, but it turns out that we're getting more and more uh, this pervasive um, connection between the internet and what we do in our, what we think of as offline lives. It turns out that they're still online lives. And it turns out that there's other things that kind of border on the edge of IoT devices, but I find them fascinating. Many of you have probably never seen something like this. It turns out that this is in fact what's called a programmable logic controller which is the really fancy term for computer that controls industrial machinery that can kill you if something goes wrong. So what is an IoT security researcher trying to accomplish, right? Most of the time, you're trying to understand how the device functions and understand its security properties so that you can make informed judgments about the risk that that poses to your organization. Sometimes, if you're like me, you like to find vulnerabilities, both so that you can get them patched and improve the security state, but also because, as we all know, CVEs are the currency of hackers, and it's the new altcoin. Um, and maybe you just want some more experience into uh, hacking things that you haven't tried before. There's also the benefit uh, that it's a hack all the things kind of moment, because I've heard um, hacking on IoT referred to as hacking in the 90s because of the lack of mitigations and how easy it is to exploit some of these devices, shooting fish in a barrel, which is fairly self-explanatory and a CTF on the whole internet. Uh, and it turns out that these devices vastly outnumber conventional computers already, and they're only growing in population even more. But it turns out, in addition to these opportunities, there's challenges for the security researcher. IoT devices typically aren't x86-based. They are more often running an ARM or MIP CPU, or even a more esoteric architecture. So you might need to uh, become familiar with a new architecture that works in different ways. They interface in different ways, while they all inherently have networking interfaces in order to be considered part of the Internet of Things, they also have other interfaces that you might not have ever seen before. And while they speak some protocols that you're familiar with, like HTTP, sometimes they speak protocols that you may never have heard of before, like MQTT, CAN bus, or other proprietary protocols. So like I said, these devices have a bunch of different interfaces. Some of them have common interfaces like Wi-Fi, Ethernet, 
Bluetooth, USB, things that you've seen every day and in all kinds of security engagements in the past. But it turns out they also have uncommon interfaces like Zigbee and Z-Wave, proprietary interfaces, and they're interfaces inside the device as well that you can get access to, like UART and JTAG and SWD and SPI. And if those sound like just a bunch of uh, acronyms put together um, to you, then that's how they sounded to me when I first started hacking on these devices. But it turns out these interfaces are some of the most useful ones when you want to understand how a device works. So this is an example of a home hub device, which is an automation, uh, home automation device intended to talk to uh, accessories that are manufactured by a variety of different companies. Consequently, it can speak a number of different protocols and it serves as a gateway between these proprietary wireless protocols and the internet. So it has a number of different interfaces, which makes it uh, an ideal uh, uh, situation for someone who's interested in taking a look at it. And when I say it has a number of interfaces, it turns out there's five separate wireless chips on this one board. Um, including things that you're familiar with, like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, all the way to highly proprietary protocols like Lutron and Kitty. But in addition to these five wireless protocols, there's this many wired interfaces on this one board. There's JTAG interfaces for multiple microcontrollers present on the board. There's a USB plug that uh, is not labeled, but it turns out if you hunt through footprints, you can find out it's USB. There's even an unpopulated Ethernet port. In the bottom left, we even have a port that to this day I haven't figured out what it's used for. So there's some basic tools you're gonna need if you wanna understand devices that are uh, in the IoT at the hardware level. Right, obvious one is you need some way to get into these devices. So a lot of them can be opened with basic uh, screwdrivers, but it turns out some of them think they're gonna keep people out if they use a Torx screw, because you know no one knows how to buy a Torx screwdriver from Amazon. Some of them, it's, they, they, they've gone a little cheaper. They're not using screws. It turns out that three cents worth of screws is the difference between profit and not if you're selling a device for $4. So they use uh, either adhesives or little plastic clips um, to hold the device together. And so you'll use a prying tool like this to get in. I'll go ahead and warn you, if they're using those plastic clips, you're gonna break some of them. Just gonna happen. Um, if you've never seen this before, it's a multimeter. Uh, many people use them to uh, test electrical things, uh, including these kind of devices. Um, this is about a $50 multimeter. Uh, you don't have to spend a huge amount. You don't have to buy a high-end Fluke, which is you know, an industrial multimeter. But it is useful for understanding how a device works and what components connect to each other and what those components do, because you can use it to determine which pins are connected within a circuit. You can use it to determine which pins have uh, power being supplied to them at any given time. So it's really easy to get lost in all of the tools that are out there, and I think it's important that you think about what capabilities do these tools give me? What does it add to my tool set in order to do it? Because you can buy dozens of different tools that all give you the same ability. And unless you're like me and buy them under the guise of, oh, I gave talks about this, so I need all of them so I can compare them and make nice slides, uh, it turns out the reality is you don't actually need all of those uh, tools. So I want to go through a few different missions that you might be doing against an IoT device and talk about what tools are useful in those space. So for example, if you want to do a wireless man in the middle, this actually isn't very unique to IoT. In fact, many of you may have done this before. Really, you just need a wireless interface and some software that's capable of intercepting the traffic. You can do it off your standard laptop, join the same Wi-Fi network perform an ARP spoofing attack to get a man in the middle position, and then redirect traffic if you see HTTP or HTTPS to a local proxy, and you can immediately start playing with the traffic. Um, it turns out most IoT devices don't do certificate validation, so very often you'll do this redirection and you'll immediately start seeing the traffic. But maybe you wanna try something different. You wanna actually get your hands on the hardware, right? That's where things become different between IoT and between typical software applications. So if you want to get a local shell, a lot of devices have what's called a UART, which is a fancy term for a serial port. It's just a serial port that doesn't operate at 12 volts like the old school serial ports of the 80s. It usually is at about 3.3 volts on modern hardware. And you can use one of these cables pictured here, and you can just connect the pins to the four pins uh, of the UART, and then you're able to interact with a local shell. And it turns out many of these devices 
they don't bother with uh, having authentication or with having um, complex passwords. Very often, if they have bothered to set a password, it's root or the name of the manufacturer of the device because they assume no one's getting physical access. Um, the hardest part in most of these cases is figuring out the pinout. Uh, on this particular board, they were kind enough to label all of the pins, so that makes it incredibly straightforward. On many other boards, you'll just see a row of four pins and you'll need to figure it out, which is when the multimeter comes uh, in very handy. Because you can determine which pin is ground by finding another point that you know uh, to be ground, such as the input of the um, power device will have a positive and a ground side. And you can compare uh, those pins to find which ones are at the same voltage and then connect to it. For TX and RX, there's fancy ways that you can figure out which one is transmit and which one is receive. But I'll be completely honest, I try it one way and if that doesn't work, I swap the two cables and try it the other way. Yeah, I promise you won't hurt things by transmitting into the wrong side of a UART. I've done it dozens and dozens of times. So once you're in, maybe you want to dump the firmware, right? Like some of you may have some binary analysis experience, you have experience with reverse engineering, and you want to be able to get access to the firmware in order to figure out what the device is actually doing. So it's possible you can do that over a serial port. Um, I've in fact done it over a serial port before where I just used DD off of the uh, flash device that stores the firmware and sent it over the network to another system. But let's assume that you're not able to do that through the serial port. Maybe you haven't found a serial port or maybe it's locked down with a password you haven't yet obtained. There's an interface that's called JTAG and it turns out it's present on almost all devices even if it's not marked. JTAG stands for the Joint Test Action Group, and it turns out that in the 90s, silicon manufacturers got together and said, you know what, it would be great if there's an industry standard for testing if our silicon is working correctly. And so they came together and they formed JTAG and they created a universal interface that allowed them to test uh, their devices. Turns out most of these JTAG interfaces also let you interact with the devices. And this interaction happens directly in the silicon so that the operating system of whatever device you're operating on doesn't even see it. It's actually a special core that's built into ARM and MIPS and PPC processors that lets you uh, interact directly with the hardware. On many processors, it's possible to disable it but most manufacturers don't seem to do that. And I think the reason that they don't do it is because if they get a device back as being malfunctioning from a customer, they want to be able to debug it. And this is a testing interface. So when they get that device back, they can connect to this interface themselves and figure out why the device is not working. There's another way to get at the firmware. You can actually dump flash chips directly. Uh, for example, I've run into many cases where the flash, uh, the firmware update is encrypted when it's sent over the network, so I can't just intercept it over the network. But in order for the uh, processor to boot from the firmware image, it has to be decrypted when it's written to flash. So if you can read the flash chips directly, you can get access to the unencrypted firmware. Some of them are very simple interfaces. On the bottom you have a little 8-pin interface, and that 8-pin interface uh, is either going to be one of two things called SPI or I2C, and it turns out you can just connect directly to that chip and you can actually dump the entire chip, and that's more common on cheaper low-end devices. On devices that are either more expensive, need more flash, need higher speed flash, they use a type of flash uh, that is a parallel flash, which is what's pictured at the top, this is exactly the same type of uh, flash chip that is the same architecture of flash chip that is used in modern SSDs and flash drives. Uh, so it turns out that they're well studied and well understood, but they're a little bit more complicated because as you note, instead of having eight pins, they have something like 48 pins. The particular board I took a picture of here, you'll also note those extra places for soldering chips. It's because the manufacturer designed it so that they could use chips from multiple suppliers on the same production run. So depending on which chip they use, they place it differently on this board. But the principle remains the same. You can detach this chip and you can place it into a reader and read the um, decrypted contents directly. Turns out that there's a number of different ways to do it. This is a particular, uh, actually a software defined radio board that I have. And I thought this was interesting because you have a flash chip that contains a firmware right there and you also have two different JTAG pinouts all right next to each other. So this one is nicely labeled so that you can actually figure out what things are there. 
but very often they're not labeled, and you just have to sort of develop an instinct for what an unlabeled port might be. So how do you do this, right? I said connect to these things and uh, dump the information. Well, it turns out you need some sort of interface between your computer and either the flash chips or the JTAG ports. And these interfaces uh, very often are referred to as universal interfaces because they can speak a number of different protocols. One of the earliest implementations was something called the bus pirate at the top. And then there's uh, chips made by a company called FTDI that do it, and it turns out you can buy cheap breakout boards for those chips. They both have their pros and cons. For example, the bus pirate actually uses a microcontroller that performs what they call bit banging of all the protocols. Bit banging just means that it says set this pin high, set this pin low in order to speak the protocol. Consequently, it's very intensive on the microcontroller, which means that it's actually very slow. But it's able to speak virtually any protocol you can implement because it's all written in software. On the other hand, you have this series of chips from FTDI. These are literally designed as a bridge between USB and arbitrary other protocols. So they're designed to operate at a high speed for speaking a variety of different protocols. So these um, ones can come on these breakout boards, or you can even get a cable where the chip is integrated right there into the uh, head end of the cable, and then it just breaks out as little pins that you can plug directly onto things. More and more I'm reaching for this over the bus pirate, even though these are a little bit more expensive, I find that they're faster and more reliable for dumping um, firmware images. Uh, one manufacturer's even made a uh, version that they specifically targeted to the security and reverse engineering community, uh, which is called the Shikra, but there's a number of other boards, and at the end of the day, they're all a USB port and some uh, connections to pins. So what do you do in order to actually do it, right? If you're going via JTAG or SWD, you connect via the JTAG interface. The pinouts are well documented, depending upon what architecture you're looking at. You can halt the CPU, which tells it to stop running anything, so you get a consistent state, and you can dump the address space uh, of the flash. And then you can use software to find the different sections of flash. One of the nice things about JTAG is that you can also dump the running RAM. So if there's encryption keys or something like that, you can also use that to get that out. If you're doing uh, SPI or I2C flash, which is the little eight pin flash controllers, uh, you'll need to connect to it with the target unpowered or halted and then dump the flash memory from the host. There's tools out there that just do that directly because they know they're speaking SPI and can do it with a single command line. For NAND or NOR flash, it's a little more complicated. When you have those 48 pins, you can't typically do it while the device is still in circuit, so you actually have to desolder the chip, insert it into a reader, and then uh, dump the flash using the reader uh, directly. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated, but it's highly reliable to be able to do that. And if you have a sacrificial device, if you have multiple ones on an assessment, uh, do, taking that approach is very efficient and straightforward. So finally, you want to find the vulnerabilities in the firmware that you've dumped, right? That's the end game here, is trying to figure out whether or not this is secure. So most of the time, the images may be compressed, have multiple petitions, some of them will be a raw image, some of them will have file systems inside of it. It turns out there's a bunch of different ways uh, to approach this. Occasionally, they'll be encrypted, particularly if you download it from their site instead of dump it from a device. Um, sometimes they'll be signed as well if a manufacturer is doing things correctly, but it turns out uh, that more often than not, they're not in fact signed. So there's a single tool out there that everyone I know in this industry who deals with hardware uses for finding this, and it's a tool called Binwalk. Binwalk actually goes through the entire file looking for file signatures within it that indicate that you have a compressed file system, a Linux kernel, uh, any number of different types of things, and they can actually extract at those different offsets. So you can immediately find some OS level issues. For example, if you extract a file system, you might find a shadow file like this one that has the root password hash in it, right? You throw that into a, your favorite uh, cracking tool of choice and you find out that this particular hash comes back to be the very secure password root. Alternatively, you can find service configuration credentials, sometimes you find private keys, um, you can, uh, I found one device that was pulling um, their configuration from a private Git repository over SSH, but had the SSH key unencrypted on the device so anyone in the world could reach that. 
Um, you'll also find some things in web interfaces. Many of these devices have web interfaces, and this will let you get directly to the source code of it. So your black box analysis has now become a white box analysis. So when you're looking at binaries, right, I mentioned they're not always x86, so how do you look at it, right? Many of you are familiar with IDA. IDA is very expensive for anyone who, uh, you know, hasn't had the opportunity to purchase that before. If you buy it with the decompilers, you might end up spending as much as about $10,000 if you buy IDA and all of the decompilers available for it. But it is probably the most powerful tool in this list. Binary Ninja, on the other hand, has only really been available for about two years now. But Binary Ninja actually handles a number of architectures, and it has an open plugin architecture for it, so people have written additional disassemblers for other architectures. And its interface actually is easier to use than IDA. And then if you really don't want to spend any money whatsoever, you can use Radari 2, which is based on the capstone framework for disassembly, and that gives you the most options. Either way, you can perform your analysis on the binaries this way. So let's say you want to take a different tack. You have a device that does Bluetooth, and you want to observe the communications. Turns out traditional chipsets don't have an easy way to sniff Bluetooth because Bluetooth does channel hopping. But there's an open source device out there called the Ubertooth One that's designed specifically for sniffing and replaying Bluetooth communications, and it works extremely well. Nordic Semiconductors also makes a firmware for some of their chips designed to do sniffing instead of communications. At the end of the day, you can use either of these, and you can actually just dump the uh, packets that you see, the Bluetooth frames, to a PCAP, and you can import that into Wireshark, which will tell you about the endpoints in use, will break it down, and then you're responsible only for analyzing the application-level communications. If you have a proprietary wireless interface, things get a little murkier. You have to delve into the realm of software-defined radio. Software-defined radio basically means that they're using an FPGA with software loaded onto it in order to represent what would have been a traditional radio interface. Until about five or ten years ago, these radios were at the cheapest several thousand dollars for a software-defined radio, but there's now several models that are available, including the Hack RF and the Blade RF shown here, that are available for a few hundred dollars to get into it. If you only want to do listening, you can also use a cheap $20 dongle and you can observe a wide variety of communications that way. But it turns out you'll have to figure out how the communications are modulated and a bunch of other information. In fact, even finding the signal can be difficult. You'll have to figure out either based on time or frequency strength or look up the device on FCCID.io which sometimes will tell you what frequency it operates on, and then you'll have to figure out what modulation they're using. Beyond that, you'll need a way to decode it and then re-encode it. And in both of these cases, there's great resources available for GNU Radio because it's an open source project and there's plugins you can use for it, but many of the manufacturers still are using something that doesn't work in exactly the same way as what's out there. However, with a radio like this, you can both observe their communications and you can transmit it. For example, I have a garage door opener for my apartment complex garage, um, and it took me less than an afternoon as my first like steps into SDR um, analysis. And within an afternoon, I was able to find a way to decode that and then begin replaying it for my software-defined radio. So there's some other tools you might want to explore. Logic Analyzer, sometimes useful. Logic Analyzer, I think of it as a network tap for physical buses. It lets you plug in, and instead of being a communications endpoint, you observe the ongoing communications between two devices. So you can see data being loaded from a flash chip into a microcontroller. You can see CAN bus in your car using a Logic Analyzer, so you can see the different computers in your car talking to each other. I really recommend not doing that while the car is moving. Um, and it's basically Wireshark for hardware, so it's pretty awesome to be able to use that and actually see the protocol on the wire. You can also use it to identify protocols and pinouts, sometimes find uh, settings for different things because it can tell you what speed a different, uh, as a particular interface is operating at because it actually just operates by repeatedly sampling the signal that's going across there. Also useful sometimes is a power supply. Um, I built this little thing using a module from China. It was about $40 total, and I can program in any voltage that I want up to about 40 volts um, out of it. You can get these modules already built into boxes like that as well. Um, most useful, though, are the 5 uh, and 12 volts and 3.3 volts because you can feed them directly into boards that you've removed from their casing and be able to power those uh, boards up. 
It's also useful to avoid like the big mess of those wall warts. I mean, I have an entire box of wall warts at home where I'm like, oh, that might be useful someday. And then you actually try to get one out of there and they're all tangled together. And it turns out this is a lot cleaner. So a little bit of a summary, right? There's software and hardware involved in this toolkit. In terms of software, if you're doing binary analysis, you'll need a disassembler, decompiler. When you're looking at the full firmware image, you'll need binwalk to try to find things. You'll also need various extraction tools. Um, tar and zip are very common, but there's also a compression protocol called LZMA that's used by a bunch of these uh, different firmware images because it compresses even better. You can use tools for fuzzing and testing. You can use QEMU is an emulator program to run programs that are not in their native architecture. So you can run an ARM or MIPS binary directly on your workstation. And then there's tools for interfacing, like OpenOCD is a software for uh, talking to JTAG interfaces. And FlashROM is the tool for dumping SPI and I squared C flash. And then of course you have networking um, tools like BetterCap and EtherCap for doing man in the middle. Wireshark TCP dump for talking, uh, for reading packet protocols and doing uh, other things as well. And of course, HTTP proxying for HTTP communications. On the RF side, Wireshark is again useful. It turns out Wireshark has so many capabilities I never knew about. Uh, as our GNU radio and Osmocom SDR is just a bunch of building blocks for GNU radio. And it really speeds up the development process if you get into that. On the hardware side, there's a bunch of general tools. Um, screwdriver, multimeter, that UART cable is one of the most useful things I've found and the easiest ways to get into things, um, which is why it appears in both of these lists. And then on interfacing, the UART cable again, the FTDI breakout is my favorite there, bus pirate. Um, and you'll notice again under flash dumper, FTDI breakout, which is why I said, think about the capabilities in ads. If you get the FTDI breakout, you have both of those covered. Uh, on the networking side, you obviously want Ethernet and wireless interfaces. Um, surprisingly, I wouldn't have to. Th I wouldn't think that I need to mention you should have an Ethernet interface. But if you've bought a laptop in the last three years, you have to think about that. Uh, chip and board level analysis. So you can get a logic analyzer, oscilloscope, power supply. Right. You don't need all of this to get started, but um, you can do various things on the RF side. The Ubertooth one. Uh, RTL SDR, which is the dongle that was originally designed for receiving over the air television. Hack RF, Blade RF are two great options for open source software defined radios that can both transmit and receive. Um, and then a few links. If you're really interested in this stuff, there's so much more to go into, right? This is just skimming the surface and telling you the basic tools um, that you can start playing with. But there's some great resources on these sites. And if you really want to get in depth, uh, I can highly recommend the hardware security.training. Um, courses. They're wonderful. They're taught by people who are passionate about what they do and are just into breaking hardware professionally. Um, so at this point, I'm, I've run out of time, which is great, uh, but I will be happy to discuss this with anyone who wants to out in the hallway or I'll be in the CTF room all afternoon because I'm also one of the CTF organizers. Um, I have a link there to, to a blog post that has much of the, the content here as well as my slides are up at 1337.fyi slash toolkit. Um, as well as my blog or Twitter, reach out to me if you uh, want any more information or just want to talk about hardware hacking IoT devices. So thank you very much.